probably you heave yourself out of the So, it's people night. You look different, Bob. Do I? Yep, like I flipped forward a few chapters instead of turning a page. I mean, you look like you, just not the you I knew. I have no idea what you're saying right now. He chuckles, you sound like Lockjaw. Remember him? Never followed a damn thing I said. Good guy, but not big on um, the thinking thing. Who smiles? His teeth are perfect. I'm saying that you look more mature, like you know more now. It's written on your face. Thanks getting used to. It's weird thinking that you have eight years of experiences that I know nothing about. I used to know everything about you. Owner of his mouth pinches tight. I used to know how the world worked too, at least I thought I knew. So, what about you? He gives you a once over. How are how are you doing? Um I'm a little freaked out. I don't know this city at all. I feel like an alien here. Same here. I may look like I belong here, but I feel like a complete outsider. Regardless, you're good at running this group. But I still don't completely understand. He picks up an ammo box and begins using it as a dumbbell. What do you get out of being a shadow runner? I don't know. Guess it's about seeing the world how it really is, underneath underneath the veneer. Most people don't want to know how the sausage is made. If it's fucked up bad, you can see it, right there from the outside. No need to look beneath the casing to see what's inside, you're not gonna like it. And in, even if you're the type that needs to know, the type that can't help but to look into the abyss, what do you get out of it? Odds are, you get nothing but a much shorter lifespan. The trade-off doesn't really seem worth it to me. And at the end of the day, what are you? A shadow runner, a disposable asset, sinless, slithering through the cracks of society, doing jobs that are too dirty for the corpse to do themselves. You don't even appear on a corporate balance sheet. I think runners can be a bit more than that. They can move their own agenda, fight the power. I wouldn't add, add the fight the power there. But moving your own agenda. Own agendas are not about fighting the power. That's stupid. It's like... I view it as like a world is full of actors of different size and power. I guess I, I guess you could say sort of visualize it as a stream or a river, and a lot of, like each water drop or a current or something like that. It's an individual actor pushing their own thing. The thing is, just. To get to where you want, you you have to try to push, or you can just say I don't give a shit and just go with the flow. But fighting the power would be sort of worthless. It's like fighting the stream. You're you're not gonna get anywhere like that. You're you're taking too much on yourself. There's no real power to fight. It's just the stream of all the will powers and uh, I guess the results of the actions of all the various actors. It's just too strong of a thing for anyone to really fight against. But you can influence where you go. You can ma make your own moves and influence things. 
you maybe if you can get enough people to side with you or share your views you can pour a little bit of a current of your own but I feel that just fighting the power is you're just you're just picking fights that aren't getting you anywhere you're wasting the influence and power you have on something that you can probably never really make any kind of a real change in. What you should be focusing is moving things around in the direction you want to go. Navigate the river. I've never heard a story where a shadow runner did something other than kill someone, steal something or perpetrate some other sort of shady shit. But you don't control the storytellers either. But good luck with that. But we've already had a few missions and we made a difference. We could have chosen differently in a, a lot of places and change how things ended up, how the current would be flowing after the fact. We could have uh, done different things with the ghoul, we could have uh, just killed the vampire, all the things there. So, I think Duncan might have have too high of an expectation. Just because you can single-handedly Change the way the world is, it doesn't mean you can't influence it. Make ripples, hopefully, in uh, the effect ripples to other areas. It doesn't have to be a thing like that, it's your everyday thing. I mean, how you act in general will ripple to the people around you, and you more or less usually get what you deserve. At least that's what I've found. It's actually all fair, rarer that people get on, get shit on totally undeservedly, or get good things totally undeservedly. Who watches you, waiting for you to say something? Well, thoughts about the last run? I don't. I don't care. Talk about. Are you thinking about getting chromed up? With cyber? He shakes his head. Oh my god, how many times are you gonna ask me that? Until you give me a good answer. Who grins? His teeth are blindingly white. I told you one time I was thinking about it when I was 13. Let it go. I'm not gonna pollute my body with that shit. You? I'm a shaman who we don't tend to go in for a lot of cybernetic augmentations. Yeah, I guess you've got a point there. It's a good thing, by the way. Better to keep yourself whole and in touch with the world around you. I may not have magic, but I know that's true. Good enough. You and me. You're not acting like the Duncan Wu that I grew up with. What made you decide to become a cop? I needed structure. Bad. You know that better than anyone. I was already hardcore when we met, Mr. Ultraviolence. I'd do anything to get a rise out of the guys I was rolling with. Gouging eyes, inverting knees, corp curb stomping. That shit got me cheers. I was like a pit fighter, blood letting for the crowd, and I learned to enjoy it. But I never learned how to block out the memories of their screams when I was lying in bed at night. The guilt started eating me alive. Then I was scared to be alone with my thoughts. So I tried to drown them all out with all the things that you drown things out with. You never told me that before. You seemed to have it under control when we were together. It's funny how people remember things. Yeah, when we squatted together and later, when we were living with Ray, 
It was still a violent son of a bitch, but basically under control. But that was you, Uncle Bob. You were the voice of reason, the brains. Me, the brains? Don't pretend you weren't the leader. Do you know how it was? When we ran the streets together, I was the muscle and you called the shots. You pointed and I hit. But later, after Ray got me some counseling, I realized I let you call the shots so that I wouldn't have to. Because I knew that what I wanted was wrong. By following your lead, I was deflecting my own hill onto you. I could just knock heads and walk away clean, you know. Don't look at me, I'm just doing what I'm told. And then you left. Without you there, I knew that I was in serious trouble. The poster boy for anger management issues. Raymond could provide a stable environment, a decent therapist, and money for prescriptions, but you know Raymond is an egghead engineer with a philanthropic streak, not a drill sergeant, and a drill sergeant was what I needed. I needed structure and discipline in a way that he couldn't offer me. I needed a cage to keep myself in line. So I found myself a cage made of rules and procedures and training. Lone Star. Yeah, I can't take Lone Star seriously. Not after watching Spaceballs. It's the only thing I think about when I hear it. Raymond helped me with my application and provided a decent character reference. I got in and it helped a lot. Lone Star got me where I needed to be. And now it's all gone and you're back. Okay. Hmm. Anything going on with the girls? Isabel is jacked into the octopus. Her body sits inert, her breathing shallow. As you approach, an image blossoms under the largest of the octopus's view screens. Hello there. Good to see you again. She smiles down on you from the monitor, her outlines scintillating with blue-white light. She looks peaceful at ease. You really feel at home in the Matrix, don't you? You look happy in there. I suppose that I am. It's a comfort thing. And lo as long as I'm jacked in, I can be whoever I want to be. Whatever I want to be. Out there in the in this meat space, I usually feel uncomfortable in my own skin. Avatar offers you a lopsided smile. I'd probably just leave in here if I could. I've heard about diggers who tried it. Never turned out well. Dehydration is a bad way to go. I know, I know. And of course I was joking, but truth be told, I do spend most of my time out there, wishing that I was back in here. If you were a digger, you'd feel the same. It's hard to live in a cage of meat when you know how sweet it feels to leave the body your body behind. Nice avatar. That's a good look for you on you. Isn't it? I spent months customizing this avatar. She feels more real to me than my own skin. She pauses for a moment considering. Then her avatar shimmers forward, filling the screen. A slight frown crosses her face. You know, Uncle Bob, I've been thinking about the question you asked me a little while back. One about the walled city. They are the one that I dodge. Yeah, I remember. Look, I wasn't trying to cheat you out of your answer. I want you to know that. It's just that talking about the world city is uh, problematic for me. I understand. I grew up, out, grew up in the barrenness. I know how hard it can be to talk about this stuff. No, it, 
isn't that. I'm not explaining myself correctly. It isn't that I'm tortured by, by bad memories or anything like that. The problem is that I can't remember my childhood. Walt City, the entire chapter of my life, is nothing but a blur to me. I can give you general information about life on the inside, but the specific of my own experience are gone. What do you mean gone? Do you have amnesia or something? Something like that. Avatar fidgets on the screen. There were a variety of factors in play. The upshot of all this is that there are things that I can tell you about, but only a few and only in bold strokes. Don't expect any personal stories, I couldn't share them even if I wanted to. So if that's okay with you, if you'll be satisfied with trivia and urban legends, then we can talk, just say the word. Otherwise, well, at least now you know why. Mm -hmm. How did you lose them? I'd rather not go into it, it's personal. Suffice it to say that I've never missed them, at least not until now. If you ever want to talk about it... Great, I'll keep that in mind. Okay. Can you give me... Can you... Can... Give me what you can about the walled city. At this point, anything would help. Alright. Uh, the avatar leaks its lips, nods. I can do that. Isabel's avatar turns, begins to pace on the screen, where she steps, spider webs of the light spread across the tiled ground of the octopus's sculpted matrix hub. When I think of the walled city, the things that stand out the most in my mind is the legends, the mythology of the place. If I hadn't lived with them, I might have found those stories fascinating. The scintill sc scintillating figure turns to you on the screen. If you know what Kowloon Walled City is supposed to be cursed, that's what the locals believe. We had ghost stories and everything. Ghost stories? Our own homegrown legends about things that haunted the Walled City. Demons from another place, the Yama Kings. Tell me whatever you can about these things. It'll probably be easiest to think of them like urban legends. Our own little pantheon of monsters and morality tales to frighten ourselves at, with, uh, at night. The stories are still clear in my mind, even after everything that happened. Everything in the walled city believed them. You can get out of the walled city if you make a deal with Fu Man. Cut the hearts from the 44 people closest to you and bring them to him. He will reward you with riches. Don't go under the ark or Quen Jia will catch you. The avatar grabs the air. It hands leaving glowing trails as they move. She'll rip you out your teeth. Tie your tongue in a knot and make you her slave for eternity. We had Jia Xian, our own homegrown judge of souls. People would let themselves be flayed alive in hopes that he'd reawaken them in a better life. And we had Lam Wu, the Ebony Queen, who'd teach you to hide so well that you'd slowly mutate it into a cockroach. The avatar cocks its head, smirking, a dismissive gesture. It's all bullshit, of course, but everybody in the walled city believed it. If you're so convinced that these things are myths, why does everyone in the walled city believe in them? Because they're an excuse. My parents and neighbors, their whole generation, invented things to explain away their own failings. I can't get ahead because demons are keeping me down. Woe is me, woe is me. It's almost embarrassingly transparent when you really look at it. Lam we turning people into cockroaches. It's just a Kafkaesque trope layered on to a mora morality tale. Xing Xiang is just Anubis with a different coat of paint. 
And you know that archway that I mentioned? The one that Quen Ya was supposed to harm? I knew someone who found it. There was nothing on the other side but concrete. It's all superstitious drivel, Uncle Ba. The misery in the walled city isn't the fault of demons or devils. We created it and we per per perpetuate it. We blamed made-up monsters for our own failing. There's nothing more pathetic than that. What about the shared dreams? How do you explain those away? I don't know. Mass, mass psychosis? Or maybe something magical is going on? But it isn't them. They aren't real. They can't be. Anyway, that's enough for now. I'm sure that gives you plenty to chew on. My obligation to give you an answer is satisfied, I think. Well, let's talk about something else. Anything else you can think of? I don't know, maybe. I put some thought into it. Avatar pauses, turns away. After a moment, Isabel's voice pours through the studio speakers. On a second thought, maybe I do have an idea. Are you open to taking on one more on more work? Of course, kindly sending me a new job offers all the time. This wouldn't work for uh, this wouldn't be work for Auntie Cheng. Think of it as a side geek that you'd be doing for me. I think I've got a got a line on something some software that could help us. I can't get to it on my own though. It's a two person job but please. What kind of software? It's kind of hard to explain. It would be easier for me to just show you, but trust me, it'll help. I have the run all pla I have the run all planned out already. I've done the legwork. I know the location, I know the target. Just say the word and I'll send everything I have to your mission computer. You can look it over, wait it, and decide what you want to do. Send the file. The Isabel Avatar closes his eyes for a moment, then opens them with a smile. Jan, You'll find the pertinent documents waiting in your inbox. If you decide to accept the mission, just check the box in the message documentation and I'll ping my recom link automatically. It'll ping, yeah. Alright, can't wait to find out what this is all about. I'm sure that the briefing I send you will satisfy your curiosity. Trust me, Uncle Bob, this is a good job with a solid plan behind it. You'll see as soon as you've read it. And speaking of which, you should go do that now. Uh, okay, more jobs. Gobbet mm. looks up from a, a dented tin of oysters at the sound of your approach. Her rats, madness, and folly scurry for her hips up to the, her shoulders. Two sets of beady red eyes fix themselves on you. Hey Seattle, Oyster. She spares a grey lump of seafood with a fingernail, extends it to you. It smells like low tide at a municipal pier. Uh, why not? You pop the rubbery wad of flesh into your mouth and chew. An explosion of lukewarm brine is your reward. Good, huh? Half repressed memories of dumpster diving in the barrens, then a uh, merry jig in your brain as the mangled oyster slice down your throat. Ah, I've eaten worse. Exactly right. It may not be fine dining, but it's seafood and it isn't made of soy. That makes it for good in my book. She tilts back the tin, drains the remaining juice, and then flicks it into the overflowing bin at her side. So, what can I do for you? You said you'd teach me how to be a better Shadowrunner. I'm here to collect. Still remember that, do you? I just sort of assumed that you'd laugh that off. No dice, wizened mentor. 
you offered now pay up. She straightens. Hmm, okay. How about this? I'll tell you a story about a run gone bad. You'll tell me what you'd done in the runner's place, and then we'll compare notes on your answer. How does that sound? Works for me, I guess. She sweeps a tangled drop of hair out of her eyes and back over one pointed ear. After a moment of silent contemplation, she bites her lip and nods. Okay, so this is a story from early in my career. I was a part of a team here in HK, but I did some occasional moonlighting for another group based in Macau. It was a busy... I was a busy kid. Go on. The job was a hit on this tower. Sort of a treat multiplex slash apartment complex. I'm sure that they've got them in Seattle too. You know the kind. Seven youth screens, monster concession stands, half in apartments on top like barnacles and a whale. Used to go to one in back in Seattle. Let's way to watch Urban Brawl. She nods. Good. You know what I'm talking about then. Our client wanted us to break uh, into one of the apartments. The story was that the ex of at, an ex of hers, a guy named Box, lived there. She'd been cooped up with him until about a week ago. Then things start. Uh, things went sour in a big way. She wanted us to get back some things that Box kept when he kicked her out. Scared the shit out of him, bloody him up a bit, make it look like a robbery. You know the drill. Hmm. Sounds more like a job for thrill gangers than full fledged shadow runners. Yeah, uh, it was pretty bush league gig. But the pay was decent enough, not the sort of thing you'd turn down. So anyway, Sibylance, that was our group leader, had a plan. We knew that we had to go in quiet because the Metroplex had a panic system wired directly to the HKPF. If we'd gone in shooting, we'd been drowned in cops within 10 minutes. Sib thought that we could maybe take advantage of the apartment's terrible soundproofing and kick in Box's door when the movie was got loud. We'd come out near his doorway, wait for the ceiling to start training plaster, then smash our way in with his neighbors, none the wiser. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if that's a good plan. There's no way that would work. Maybe it would. I don't know, it might have. If things had gone different. But it's what we did. So pipe down and let me tell you the rest of the story. So we waited in the hall, just like Sibylline's plans. We had a guy on the elevator, another at the stairs. I was waiting by the floor's communal kitchen. Sib took up a position by the door. She had these cyber legs that she'd uh, dumped a ton of renewian into. Hydraulic jacks, strength enhancements, the works. Girl could probably leg press a dump truck. She pauses for a moment. moment. Come to think of it, most of her plans involved kicking things. There's something a little sad about that. Hey, if that was her thing, I wouldn't question it. Yeah, you are very supportive. Me, I'd have preferred to work for someone who thought with her head instead of her robot legs. Anyway, we heard a boom down from downstairs. Felt the wall shake with the ri with the reverb. Sip wheeled back and gave the door a massive kick, just as she planned. I don't really mind the kick the door in while the sound is loud type of thing. Yeah, I suppose it might go unnoticed or people might shrug it off. 
However, I, I feel a game world like this, science fiction and futuristic, you're you're basically going for first and foremost into an unknown situation and probably I would basically go in if I would go in. It's a risky thing. You could trigger all kinds of things, and if anyone basically got into your apartment like that, you would shoot first, ask questions later. It's a, it's a very risky situation to go into. From where I was standing, I couldn't really see what happened next. I could hear a massive crack as her boot slammed into Duraplast. The door flew of its hinges, exploded off might be a more accurate phrase. A second later we heard an ungodly crash. There was a moment of silence, and Sip let out this little gasp. The apartment was in shambles. It looked like a hurricane had hit it. Everything was trashed, everything but the door, which was miraculously still in one piece. Remember that this was a coffin apartment. It wasn't much wider than the door was to begin with, so you killed the And Box, well, what was left of him was under the door, too. Yeah. Well, you got the rough him up part, right? Yeah, unfortunately, he wound up a lot rougher than he was supposed to. Her nose threw crinkles in discomfort. That door really did a number on him. Ribs sticking out of the skin, that kind of thing. It was a bloody mess. So yeah, Fox was dead. The stuff that we'd been sent to the apartment to recover had been smashed to bits. And then the building alarm went off. Yeah. So that's the situation. Our payday is smashed. My temporary teammates are all standing around with stupid looks on their faces. Cops are coming and I'm standing by the kitchen. She plants her hands on her hips, smiling. What would you have done in my place? Uh, first rule of groups like this is you use keep the group together, keep the group together. You might get into trouble, I mean, unless the situation is absolutely hopeless and one of your group members decides to do something suicidal and insane, then you basically cut your losses and walk away. But in a situation like this... Uh, probably look uh, if there's anything we can salvage from the room anything worthwhile and then try to regroup and get the fuck out. Hmm. Maybe improvise first? Is there anything in the kitchen you could have used to resolve the situation? Good thinking. As it happens there was and I knew just what to do with it. The thought popped into my head and I just went with it. She taps her temple with a smile. That's a lesson to remember, Seattle. The first answer that you come up with is almost always the best one you're g gonna have. So just roll with it. Don't second guess yourself. Don't hesitate. Just act. You live longer that way. Got it. Now, when I think crowded theater, I think place where you can't shout fire because it'll cause a panic. Then I thought, Cops don't charge into burning buildings. They help people get out of them. And as it happened, I had the means to create a real genuine fire sitting right across from mine, a pair of industrial ovens. Uh, risky. You set the building on fire. I encourage it to burn. Open the gas winds went wide, set the range on a timer, and motored back into the hallway. Others had started arguing amongst themselves. I told them to snap out of it and follow me into the lobby. We had to clear the hallway before an errant spark took the whole floor out. Unfortunately, the rest of the group wouldn't listen. Even the rest of the team were too busy arguing about the relative merits of her 
Let's kick things really hard and see what happens. Tactical system to want anything to do with me. I shouted back at them that the kitchen was going to explode and continued down the hallway. Just as I'd planned, I got out of the run in one piece. So did every single one of the people in that multiplex. My fire plan worked beautifully. If the rest of the team had listened to me, they might have gotten out of the building too. Kind of a bummer that they didn't, but at least the run turned out well for me. How so? Well, I couldn't collect any pay because the run had been a disaster. But after the explosion, I got to ride in front of the fire truck, and they gave me cookies and a blanket. I wound up dating one of the, those firemen a few weeks later. All things considered, I could have gone. Uh, it could have gone a lot worse. Hobbit claps her hands together and rubs them. A satisfied look on her face. So Seattle. It, the laughter disappears from her voice and her expression goes serious. It's like somebody flipped a switch. Suddenly, the look in her eyes is shrewd, calculating. Tell me, what was the moral of the story? What lesson was I trying to convey? Don't go sh go on shadow runs with idiots. Uh, go with your guts. She nods sagely. That's right. Trust your impulses. Don't be afraid to wing it. Almost any action is better than no action at all. Once you've committed to doing something, you've got to follow it through. No arguing, no hand wringing. Just do it. If you get caught up in your own head, agonizing over past mistakes, well. Don't be surprised if you wind up dead. A kitchen fire can take you down just as easily as a cop's bullet if you stand around and let it. Are you certain that Sibylance and the rest of the Macau team are dead? She shrugs. They weren't with me when I got evacuated with the rest of the moviegoers. I never saw them leave the building and I haven't heard of them since. I guess it's possible that somebody made it, but I don't really run in those circles anymore. Odds are good that if anyone from Macau team did survive, they'd have died off by now from sheer incompetence. Shadow running is an unforgiving business. You don't get to make too many mistakes. Did the stuff in the story actually happen, or did you just make it up for my benefit? Seattle, I've heard. It all went down exactly like I said it did. She pauses. Well, except for a couple of embellishments here and there. But they m make it a better story. Artistic license and all that. Robert leans back uh, and stifles a yawn. Madness and folly dart up uh, to her left shoulder and lock their beady eyes on you. Hate to break it to you, kiddo, but I'm beat. It's been a long day. Lesson's over for now. We'll pick it up back next time. Alright, Gobbit. I'll catch you next time. Yeah, sounds good. I'll have your next lesson ready and waiting too. She makes a brushing motion in her with her fingers. Scurry along now. Her mentor needs her rest. I wonder can I talk to her about another thing immediately. Yeah. Another lesson. Yeah? She smiles. That's good. I was hoping you'd want to keep going with this. It's good for you. I'm kind of enjoying it too. Cuphead runs her a hand through the knotted ropes of her hair. A contemplative look on her face. A moment later, she turns her attention back to you. Alright, this is gonna be another long story, so I'm thinking we should take it in chunks. If you've got any questions, you can ask him along the way, and if you need to take a break, we can come back to it. Is that good? Yeah, sounds good. Good. So last time, I told you about the event that brought an end to my illu illustrious career as a subcontractor. This time, I'm gonna tell you about a run that I went on with my regular team. Uh, Nightshar's team. 
No, this was long before I hooked up with them. Is was still learning to dig back then. She was good for her age, but she wasn't ready for prime time. And it'd be another couple of years before I'd meet the Nightjar or Auntie Ching. You don't know anyone from the groups that I'm talking about. They're all gone now, anyway. You've had a rough career, haven't you? Yeah, I guess that I have, but I'm still alive. That's something. Puts me ahead of a lot of other runners I've known. The truth of the matter is, as runners, dying on the job is an occupational hazard. We're disposable asset. It shouldn't come as a surprise when we get used up and tossed away. Same way in the barrens, here today, gone tomorrow. Yeah, you know how it is. People die, and it's sad, but there's no sense moping about it. How did you meet this little group of yours? Through mutual friends. We actually all lived together before we decided to start running as a team. There was this floating squatter's commune out in Hong Hong Bay. It's probably still out there, actually. I haven't been back in a long time, but I spent a few years living on the thing, and the rest of the team lived there with me. You lived on a, what, a raft? Yeah, basically. We called it uh, the sinking ship. It wasn't much to look at, just a, a whole bunch of shipping containers all bolted together into a great big floating brick. It wasn't the most comfortable place I've ever lived, but the price was right and the company was good. Okay, tell me about the team. Sure. She extends a hand so that she can count up teammates on her fingers. Mantis scurries down her sleeve and perches on her forearm. Our muscle was a Hawaiian Jew with poor impulse control. Big round guy with lumberjack arms and ringlets in his hair. He called himself Honu. I guess he that he loved turtles. I don't know, street names are weird. We had a tech specialist, Egret. She was tall, gawky, dyed her hair bone white. She had a drone named Arlo that followed her around like a lost puppy. She was kind of a jack of all trades, but she could get the job done. Fun at parties, too. Our de facto team leader was a guy named Tui. He was a wiry troll, if you can imagine that. Probably about 2% body fat, all skin and bones, walked with a bunch of make himself, walked with a hunch to make himself look smaller. He was a shaman, followed rat like me. Can't be many troll uh, rat shamans out there. Not that I've m met, but Chewie seemed like a really good guy. We got along fine. I actually really liked everyone on the team. They were a lot of fun to run with. Okay. I think that I've got a grasp on the team dynamic. Keep going. Alright, moving on. So one day, Sui brought us a job. He'd met a client in Victoria Harbor Bar, a rich eastern tiger executive. The guy wanted us to steal something for him, a shiny object. He raises her hands. I know, I know, it's stupid, right? But that was how the Johnson described it to us. The shiny object. That was what he wanted us to get. He never gave it any other name. Alright, so what did the client tell you about this thing? He gave us a physical description. We were supposed to look for a chunk of red jade about the size and shape of an ostrich edge, egg, with a mirror polished surface and gold wire inlays. He said that it would have paper charms hanging off of it, foo talismans, Taoist sorcery stuff. We weren't supposed to touch those. I guess they're basically seals. The client also told us about the shiny objects, uh, then owner, an old hedge wizard turned entrepreneur named King Kong Ziu Yang. Okay, what's a hedge wizard? He had a whole wise old sage thing going on. 
He had the robes, the little hat, the kind smile, oh, and the piece de resistance, a long, wispy beard. He was mean as a snake, though, had a rip to prove it. Intel said the old man's young was keeping the shiny object in one of his warehouses. He had a bunch of them. He'd built himself a nice little empire selling magical para paraphernalia through puppet vendors in the Yao Ma Tai night market. Supposedly, a good fifth of the stalls in that place were on Ziu Yang's payroll. Yeah, what kind of magical paraphernalia, paraphernalia are we talking about? She begins counting off examples on her fingers. Pickled reagents in mason jars, hermetic scrolls, charms, relics rooted from Buddhist temples, crates of old uh, Balinese uh, rangdamans, fist side stones from the great dragon's kidney. Um, Gi Yang sold them all. How he got his hands on it in the first place, anyone's guess. Okay. Some of that stuff sounds valuable. Yeah, I'm sure that some of it was. Most of it was crap, though. Fakes and forgeries to sell to gullible tourists. Uh, sifting uh, the good stuff from the bad would have taken time, so we weren't planning on sticking around long enough to do that. Fair enough. So we'd cased the warehouse for a couple of nights before the run, you know. Did some recon, took some notes. From what we'd seen, we were pretty sure that Zi Yang was keeping our payday in a vault area at the very back of the building. Security was pretty heavy though. He was paying a local triad for protection and he kept a lot of the, their boys on staff. Sui was the one who came up with the plan. We split up outside and entered the warehouse in two teams. Okay, I already hate this plan but sometimes you just have to do it. Team A would create a diversion. Team B would hit the vault while security was looking the other way. We'd grab our payday, regroup, and get the hell out of there. Uh, I would prefer some kind of a timed device and go full in with a single team to get there. Because uh, every time something unexpected happens, and you really need the team to pull through without too much fuss, if you We have basically one guy in our team that might be able to do some kind of fighting on his own. He has very little abilities above that. So even a couple of guys against him could take him down. Everyone else on their own more or less couldn't handle things. It, it's We have a decent team I suppose, but we're severely lacking on the offensive power. We would have a mage would have been a good choice for a character. Okay. In my experience, splitting the group is almost always more trouble than it's worth. I I'd agree with you if we were going in expecting a straight fight, but as channel runners, you should almost never want to get into one of those. Yeah, but you. You don't expect to get killed in at, in any situation, so you you go in expecting to be able to just get a smooth run, but you also go in planning for everything. If things turn to shit and your group is divided, what the fuck are you going to do then? The other group is going to abandon the other without the, any way of informing them? What is It's going to turn into a clusterfuck. So it's still a bad idea. It, only if you absolutely have to. I mean, it's impossible to do it any other way. When you're on a job, you're always going to be outnumbered and outgunned. Going quiet is inherently safer than going loud, and if spilling the group is what it takes to do that, she shrugs. Anyway, Team A, Hanu and Igret, circled around the loading dock, just like we'd planned. Tui and I waited at the service entrance. We didn't have to wait long. A couple of minutes in, we heard this ungodly crash, then another and another. As it turns out, Ikrit had rigged into Ziyang's network of automated forklifts. He had six of them running amok in the loading dock, 
chasing down workers and then crushing themselves into anything marked fragile. Sounds like a good time. I know, right? A dreamy smile spreads across her face. I wish I could have been there to see it. Hagrid's distraction did what it was supposed to. As Tui and I watch, most of the triad guys at the service entrance abandoned their posts and went hauling off toward the loading dock. A couple of guys with baseball bats stayed back, but we handled them easy enough. We slipped inside and made a beeline for the back of the warehouse where the shiny object was supposed to be. <sighs> Let me guess. Something went wrong. No, actually it was there. Just like we thought it'd be. Door was open and everything. The shiny object was sitting there in a tea cradle, gleaming with reflected light. Just like the client had said. It had a ring of Taoist talismans hanging off of it, like a grass skirt. Paper all crinkled with age. We didn't waste any time. I reached it and grabbed the thing. It felt strange through my gloves. It jade sort of a pulse, it say, if it had a heartbeat. Ooh. Sounds ominous. Yeah, tell me about it. I wanted to drop the thing, but it was our payday, so I slipped it into my satchel instead. I couldn't get the flap closed quickly enough. The package being secure, Chewie and I returned to Hightail it out of there, and then things went to shit. Did you run into more security? Where's Old Man Zian himself was standing right there in front of us. Larger than life with sparks shooting out of his eyes. I'm guessing that when he heard the commotion in the loading dock, he'd come running, well, waddling, to make sure that his treasure was safe. And as it turns out, it wasn't because I'd already stolen it. He looked displeased. What did you do? What do you think we did? We had our backs to a wall. We lit the bastard up. It was pretty epic, truth be told. Spirits were summoned, spells were discharged, the vault door sealed behind Xing Yang like something out of a movie. At one point, the old man leapt onto Chewie's back and tried to bite his ear off. I won't bore you with the play-by-play -play of how the fight went down. In the end, we crushed him. Unfortunately, the fight had caused some collateral damage. At some point during our shadow run, uh, showdown with Xi'an, the control panel of the vault door must have eaten an arc of lightning, or the blast of a powerball. It was toast, all black and melted, and neither of us could fix it. So you were trapped in the vault? Yeah, that's about the size of it, and it was only a matter of time before the old man's remaining security guys found us in there. There was only still one way out ventilation duct up high in the rafters, but it was too small for Chewie to fit through. He was a troll after all. I had the shiny object, but if I left Chewie there and security got him, well, you do the math. So here's the conundrum. I've got our payday in my satchel. The team is split. It's in inevitable that more Triad 49ers are going to find us, but we don't know when and how many. Egret and Ho Nu are holding their own in the loading dock, for now. I can stay with Chewie to help fight the inevitable wave of Triad 49ers, but we'll be badly outmatched, like badly. The odds of surviving won't look good for either of us. If Egret weren't pinned down in the loading dock, she could probably get the vault door open, but in order to get to her, I'll have to leave Chewie alone in the vault. If Si Young's reinforcement finds Sui before I get back with Egret, well, she uses her thumb to draw a line across her neck. Um, well, wouldn't they have some sort of communication devices? I mean, I, I suppose we can assume the vault blocks it, but. Now well, that's the scenario, Seattle. Not a lot to work with, I know. Now tell me, what should I do? Um, uh, it depends. I. It depends with what's the plan of regrouping the group. I mean, they have to have either some 
way of communicating constantly, which would basically they have a they would have a way to contact others. Or two, they would have agreed something beforehand, like we do thing this you hold you hold things up for X amount of minutes, then pull out. We will regroup here. So. It would depend on the guys too, I suppose. If you if they were really trustworthy, they would probably come to your aid. But I feel some kind of a previous. It would depend on the plan and if they have communication devices, because I would assume that they have. I mean, everyone today has some kind of phone at least. So in the future, uh, it's bullshit to think that they wouldn't. So. I would take the escape, try to contact the others, and come uh, retrieve the, the guy stuck there. Well, you could use the magical artifact always. Um. I would be curious about the egg, but uh, the Scuppet's plans always end up in failure. Um, I think I'd try to use the magical artifact too, probably. I mean, in a situation where it's either one can escape or we can try something to get both of us alive. It's a gamble, but still. Could have done that, I guess. It might have worked. Of course, it could have gotten too gunned down in a vault too. In retro retrospect, that wouldn't have been a huge loss. Anyway, that wasn't what I did. I saw what I thought could be a way to save the day, so I went ahead and took it. I pushed the shiny object out of my back, still remembering how the tallest talisman that brings the ring of my hands. Okay, I, I thought I selected this same option. I remember shrugging, saying, what the hell, I put the thing into his bare hands and told him to go nuts. It was almost like too he had been waiting for me to pass him the thing. He seemed eager to take it. He hugged the chunk of rock to his chest like a newborn baby. Color swam in the stone and something changed in his eyes. The old man, Xinjiang's 49ers, reached the door and Tui unleashed hell. She pauses, frowning. Soft scratching folly and uses the hand to rub her eyes. Finally, she turns back to you. Sorrow look pinches her features. What went down in that room? Well, I have only seen that kind of carnage a couple of times in my life, and I have been running the shadows for years. Those triad men were thrown to scraps by the end of it. Don't think I'll ever forget the sound of that they made. Clears her throat. <clears throat> I, uh... Spent most of the fight to huddle up in the corner for my own safety. But Sui let loose from that stone didn't seem terribly interested in discriminating between friend and foe. He summons hostile spirits or something. Something like that. Truth be told, I don't know what they were. Like I said, I was hiding. But he couldn't have done it without the shiny object, not in a million years. Whatever they were, the rock brought them there. We waited th for things to calm down in the vault, and for the things to go slithering away. I think that Sui had some limited control over them, which is why they didn't eat us. After they were gone, Sui gave me the shiny object back. I put it in my satchel and we bailed. We collected the others on the way out. They were blissfully ignorant on what happened on the other side of the warehouse, and I didn't see a reason to change that. We hightailed it back to the docks and caught the first boat back to the sinking ship. Mission accomplished. Puppet looks away again, stares off into space. From what I'm told, people still avoid Chi Yang's warehouse like the plague. It's supposed to be haunted even to this day. 
People who set foot in the building keep turning up dead. Be sure I'm the one of the only living people who knows why. Abruptly, her body language changes. Anyway, that's it. Lesson over. If you've got any questions, go ahead. Learn more about the sinking ship. Sure, the story's over, so we can get into it. I moved into onto the sinking ship when I was just a kid. I think uh, that I was 12, maybe 13 years old at the time. In the beginning, it was just me and a couple of rat shaman friends, Cadmus and Malvina. They were older, but they were always cool to me. Is it typical for groups of rat shamans to congregate? Not terribly, no. I mean, we have lodges, same as any other group of shaman. You can usually find a few of us hanging out in those. I guess that there was just something special about our little group. Or maybe about the singing ship. We liked it. We felt at home there. It didn't hurt that the singing ship was well stocked on provisions when we uh, found it either. And don't look at me like that. It was abandoned when we took it. Abandoned? There was a team of shadow runners that had lived on the thing before us, but they beat it on a job. Cat and Mal heard the knock of opportunity and they claimed a, the raft for a rat in record time. Taking over the sinking ship wasn't an easy job, mind you. Previous owners had installed traps and automated defenses all over the raft. Cat had his hands full with those for a month. What kind of traps? The usual stuff, explosives, pop turrets, that kind of thing. Cat and his sister Yasmin took care of most of it without too much trouble. The biggest problem were the scuttling charges. The runners who built the rat had installed these explosives all along the perimeter that it ripped the bottom out of the thing if it were ever seized by the police. The explosives were tricky to deal with. Cat was able to disarm them, but he had to leave them where they were. It was always uh, slightly uncomfortable knowing that I was sleeping on top of a couple hundred pounds of dormant explosives. I can't blame you there. Tree rocks. Hey, like I said, it was free. There weren't really even any rules to follow, which suited me fine. Malvina was sort of a leader of our little nest, but we never really listened to her. She was always trying to play the mom card and instill a sense of responsibility into us. It was cute. She did have a propensity for getting things done, though. I have to give her that. Anyway, after a few months, other people started showing up. Squatters, homeless people, shadow runners, they all sorted crazies. As long as they stayed cool with us, we were cool with them. Eventually, it became a community. Imagine that. I think you wound up squatting on the Balto because of your time on the singing ship. I don't know, maybe. Never really thought about it before, but yeah, maybe. Corner of her mouth calls up upward. I guess that I'm a water rat now. Okay, was there a point to this story? There was when I started telling it. I thought I was gonna tell you to be comfortable with breaking the rules. I don't think I'm gonna say that now, though. I'm not feeling it anymore. Why not? At least your team made it out of this run alive. They didn't stay that way for long. But let's leave that for next time, huh? I don't want to get into it just now. Let's take a break. I'm sorry that this lesson wound up getting a little unfocused at the end. I'm not really sure what came over me. Happens to the best of us. Well, I still feel bad about it, so look. I'll make you a deal. Our next lesson will definitely be on point, and I'll tell you what it's about up front. No more question and answer sessions. How does that sound? Oh, yeah. I don't know if we can continue with it. I'm not gonna continue with it. This is uh, enough talking for now. I, I need to get to some action. Oh, 
I suppose, well, we have jobs already. We only need to get to... Steal data and tissue samples. Go to Ares Holding Facility, plant data. I, I do have to say that I, I'm more fan about this type of a uh, companion system than the one where you have a huge amount of people with you and you don't really get to know any of them all that well. I'd rather have a handful of good good NPC companions than, uh, ha uh, than a dozen that basically are there for the why are they there? There aren't really even that many classes that you can take in this game. Well, points of karma. I'm sort of... We could take more charisma. I could get another etiquette out of it. I, I, I like the options they open up. Not sure at this point what would, would matter. I guess I would like the shadow runner. Thing, but mm. mission. <laughs> 